And that's us recording. Des, thank you very much. You're very welcome to the written word. It's nice to be here. Thank you, Mick. So the uh, the only question I have is, uh, what are you reading? What are you listening to? Do you do Audible? Is it YouTube? What's your consumption of the written word? I'm reading uh, The Mirror and the Light at the minute, which is okay. the third. It's Hilary Mantel, Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies. And this is the third book in that trilogy about Thomas Cromwell. Right, okay. Uh, it's really interesting because it's, you know, it's about Henry VIII and um, sort of them pulling away from Europe and all the Catholic countries in Europe. And then Henry VIII wanted to sort of pull England away from everybody else. And so I was reading those books last year when Brexit and stuff was happening, which yeah. it, it was interesting how much kind of resonated. And then that, like Thomas Cromwell is kind of like a Dominic Cummins kind of figure yeah. uh, in the background. So, yeah, it's lovely. I love her writing and I, I love kind of... This, these kind of history books, you know. Okay, so I, I see you're in a hotel room, so you're, you're quarantined. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I'm locked down in Sydney. So I work on um, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, mm -hmm. which is a Harry Potter play. So one of my jobs is to go around the world and, and direct new productions of that. And we have a show running in Melbourne at the minute. So we had six shows before COVID shut everything down. Everything shut down for about a year, but the Melbourne production opened again in February. So I'm coming over to see how that's going. But to get to Melbourne, I had to do two weeks in a hotel room in Sydney, where I'm not even allowed to like leave the hotel room or open the door to anybody. So it, it really is a lockdown. Like that's crazy. Like yeah, crazy, crazy. So how, how did that uh, how did that Harry Potter gig come about? So I worked with John Tiffany, who uh, John Tiffany direct is really well known for directing Black Watch. Okay. And then, I had seen a musical that he directed on Broadway called Once, yep. which is the Glenn Hansard, Marquette, or Glover film. So I had seen that on Broadway and I wrote to him. I didn't know him, but I emailed him and said, listen, if that ever comes to London and you're looking for an assistant or an associate, please keep me in mind because you know, I'm a huge fan of the swell season. And um, he, he got back to me and he gave me a job on Once. And then Once led to when John was directing Harry Potter, he asked me to be... The associate on that so I was with Harry from very very day one like right through to and it's been five years now that I've been working on it wow so it's like my day job is going around the world directing Harry Potter yeah. so, so tell us this that that moment uh when you decided right I'm gonna write to this guy that I don't know yeah uh -huh. <laughs> have you done it before was it a one-off I've never done it it was, it was the one time in my life that I've done it and I, I always sort of thought, um, I always thought it didn't work. You know, I always thought, you know, people will, people are never going to hire a stranger for a job. But mm -hmm. um, for some reason, like that show on Broadway really spoke to me. And I, I knew like I had to be involved in it somehow. And I, so I wrote to him and actually he didn't get back to me initially. It was uh, one of the producers got back and said, John would love to interview you next, like next week in London and I was working in Belfast at the time and I emailed back and says listen sorry I'm working in Belfast do you think John would um be able to Skype me so it was I mean it's way before like this yeah. has become standard us doing zooms and stuff and they wrote back and they said yeah yeah oh, okay we'll pass the message on but something made me think that message isn't going to get to him so I emailed I found out his personal email address and wrote to him and John has worked regionally around the UK, like all his career. He, he set up like National Theatre of Scotland with Vicky Featherstone. So I wrote to him and I says, you're not from London. You work outside of London. I'm sure you can appreciate that not all artists are based in London. And I, I'm really sorry, but I'm doing a job in Belfast and I can't come to meet you next week. Would you Skype with me? So I just like, so it was the, actually the second time I'd written to him and I got a call from his PA the next day saying, John is in Boston next Sunday and will Skype with you next Sunday morning. It's just this window of time he has free. So he he found this time to um, to meet with me and we just really hit it off. Like he's working class, he's gay, he's um, really, really funny. Like within five minutes, we were like making jokes about the X Factor and, you know, we, we just really yeah. were like that very quickly. And I knew that he was somebody that I would want to collaborate with for a long time. We're still working together, so that's that's crazy, man. Yeah, yeah. Like that's absolutely bonkers. And then from from that 
meeting, what was the deal? Was it like come and try and work for a couple of weeks, or was it a job straight away, or was it you know? So the show was coming to the West End, and sort of my job was to the show existed, so my job was to be the to assist John on building the show for the West End and learn the show, um, learn how it's all put together, and then sort of maintain it because it was a long running show. And mm. then from that, I, I got to go and direct it in Korea. I directed it for three years in a row at the Olympia in Dublin, and sort of in a way, he built the show. Then sort of handed it over to me to take care mm. of and to do elsewhere. And then the same thing happened with Harry. Brilliant. So, yeah. so has, he, has he got any more guys coming up? Are you going to make it a trilogy or wait and see? <laughs> no, I, I, think, uh, I think we've done plenty together. I think it's, is that me or is that you? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, we've been working together about eight years, so I think we're, we're good. That's crazy. So how, I mean, Harry Potter can obviously run forever. Yeah. Harry Potter. So wh what's the deal? Is it... As and when a new gig goes out, how do you then fit in other projects around that work? I mean, obviously that's a gig you want to hold on to because it's great employment. It's, you know, you're going to see different parts of the world, different venues. How do you then squeeze in a, a gig in Belfast or a small project that you really want to work on? What's the... So I, I, as we set them up around the world, there are new associates that we bring on board. So. Uh, I have a brilliant associate in Melbourne. There's a brilliant one in New York, same in San Francisco. And it's sort of the more that happens, the less and less I actually have to do on the shows. It's yep. like like a family photograph where the, the bigger the family gets, the further back you move. Yeah, you go. Yep. And that was really lovely because I worked so hard on Harry Potter for a few years. And then it had just started to get to the point where I was like, okay, I can, I can start to take a bit of a back seat, still stay involved. And, and you know, it's a really great opportunity to stay involved with. But sort of hand the bulk of the work over to other people and do my own projects like stuff at the lyric or yeah. um, other projects I'm creating on my own. So in, in terms of scale, um, that first project doing once just, you know, gone from being, you know, a job and director of Belfast to suddenly hitting that size a gig, um, there's a lot to get used to. I know even from a production point of view, you know, going from the likes of, uh, the lyric to the opera is a big leap when there's more numbers, when there's more seats, there's more dollars involved, there's bigger teams. How did you find that? Was it daunting? Incredibly daunting and incredibly daunting to do it as a director as well, I think, because you have to be the person in the room that has the answer to everything mm -hmm. or people are asking you the questions. And, you know, I was a newbie to, to doing stuff in the West End, but I don't know, you sort of just have to put your poker face on and pretend you know what you're talking about even if inside you're you're screaming but um yeah. but and then you, you learn it very quickly and then um J jen rooney actually who's a choreographer who i've worked with a lot in northern ireland she yeah. i ended up getting her to come and work on once in the west end and um so she, yeah we we're trying to get as many northern irish people into the the show yeah, as possible very good and then so how many years ago was once um, I think it was about eight years ago. I did, I did it for about three years, starting eight years ago, and then I've been doing Harry for five. So that that three year stretch was that was that one lump, like thirty six months in a row type thing, or is it broken? So up? we ran we ran in the West End for about two years, and then and then I sort of rolled it out. So like there were three summers in the Olympia where it it played for Landmark Productions. Um, it's a woman called Anne Clark. Mm -hmm. who runs Landmark. They do a lot of Enda Walsh's work and once was written by Enda. So Anne produced it at the, the Olympia three summers in a row and it was and it was amazing because the tourists who go to Dublin during the summer, like all there is to do is drink and, and that's brilliant. Um, but, but Anne was just clever. She thinks she, people that, that don't necessarily want to go to a pub or people that want to go to theatre in the evening, this is a brilliant big summer show and it's set in Dublin and it's a Dublin story and people will know Glenn and the music. So it did really, really good business in the Olympia. Yeah. And then uh, how, how do you, how does that work in parallel? Suddenly you're on, you're on once with the bigger gig and you've other, you know, with other stuff come up in terms of directing smaller shows. Um, is it, is it a reality call? It's a wake up call when you walk into your room and go, with no money, there's four actors and, and, and that's it. Um, yeah, but I, I suppose it just, 
actually once was such a simple show. It was, um, a, a, the music is complicated, but it is a show with like three tables and eight chairs and then actual musicians and, mm -hmm. and, but actually the creativity and that comes out of the necessity of having to, to do a complicated show with nothing. Like I sort of took that and then I put that into other work that I started to do, like Good Vibrations, which was of course like heavily influenced by Once and it was an actual musician show and sort of going back and, and finding um, just creative ways to things and not, um, I, I think it would have been different if I'd worked on something like Cats or Miss Saigon, which yeah. was big spectacle, but actually once was made by John Tiffany, who's from National Theatre Scotland, Stephen Hoggart, who's from Frantic Assembly. They come from a sort of legitimate, it's probably the wrong word, but just the, the same type of theatre that we make, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Good Vibrations, um, how did that come about? I'm sure that was an experience. Yeah, so Jimmy asked me to, uh, we spent about two years developing it, and I think uh, a good musical does take that to develop and redraft it. Yeah. Jimmy came to me and he said, I had done a musical in Derry called Teenage Kicks, which used punk music. Mm -hmm. and, and when Jimmy, very early on, when Jimmy had started the lyric, he came to me and he had this idea about doing good vibrations on stage. And I thought it was a terrible idea. I said, you know, I'd love to, but it's such a perfect film. Yeah. And it's such a cool film. And then the idea, and punk music is so cool. The idea of doing that on stage with people singing and dancing, probably felt a bit naff and and I didn't want to be the person that messed it up you know this this lightning in a bottle film that had gone so well you didn't want to be the person that made mm. a naff music out of it so it took a long time for me to be convinced that it would work and we did a, a lot of workshops with Glenn and Colin the writers um, and just there was one workshop that we did lyric where we did five days and and we did a showing at the end and there was just electricity and the in the showing that I was like, oh yeah, this this does work. Yeah. And it's something about the live music as well. And there's yeah. there's something that you get from live music and something that you get from a gig that you actually don't get from a film. And that was the, the thing that tipped it for me. And that was due to go on again, wasn't it? Uh, before COVID struck. Yeah, so it was going to come back to the lyric and then it was going to go to the Abbey and then it was going to go to New York. So um, the Irish Art Centre have built a brand new theatre in Hell's Kitchen. And we were going to be the opening show for that theatre, okay. and obviously COVID struck. So, do you think it'll it'll get another run? I hope so. Um, it's a it's a story about filling empty dance floors after you know a city has been locked down. So I think yeah. there there's no more perfect story to tell post COVID than you know, the story of Terry who like found these bands and filled these empty rooms with music and dance and young people. Yeah. You, you also uh, were you involved in uh, the filming stuff with was Lyric and BBC. Yeah, so last last year they did Splendid Isolation, which was brilliant. Mm. They they commissioned seven, was it seven? Six or seven writers to write short pieces and, and seven directors. I think it was seven, anyway. Um, so me and Lisa McGee made a piece together and Anthony Boyle, who was in the original production of Harry Potter, was in our piece, yeah. um, and it was it was my first time doing film, like film okay. TV. How did you find that from going to, you know, years and years of of theatre, which is a certain structure, to suddenly doing TV, different 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 ballgame, different mindset, or totally different, um, but amazing and like actually life changing. So I've after I'd done that, I made that a uh, little short and I just got the bug and I've sort of reached out to some TV people and said, I want to do more of this. And Lisa, I had an idea for a TV show that I said to Lisa, like, if if I tell you the story, will you write it? And, mm. and she was going to, but Lisa's just the busiest woman on the planet right now. And she says, listen, I'll help you, but I, I actually can't write it. So in January, I had a go at writing it myself and I right. wrote uh, a pilot. And it's been picked up to be developed by a production company. Yeah, that's super good. And that's like that's what I mean, life changing. Because it's like I think I've sort of discovered this new path that I'm yeah. probably going to spend the next couple of years writing more for screen and TV and stuff. Yeah. So, and yeah. are you going to direct it or get another director in, or what's the? I hope so. I mean, the whole the whole purpose of it was for me to 
employers sure enough, yeah. need to direct something and suddenly like by accident I've ended up writing so well but you know like how blocks on tv there's different blocks of things and you know even yeah. if I get an episode that would be yeah, yeah. a show real for me that to be a, a I and even going through the process of of getting the pilot and understanding okay here, here's how it all works um yeah. have you written for stage before I've never written I, I had never written a scene until January this year okay um, so, so tell me about that well, it was um I don't know I suppose it's fair like you you know better than anybody what it's like to you know change career and head off a laptop going what do I do this for <laughs> yes um to have a go at writing um I don't know, it's very exposing and it's very, uh, I don't know, it's very nerve wracking to like, you, you cringe with everything you write and I hated my dialogue and I hated every bit of it. And, but I just forced myself to finish it. I was like, I'll give this a go and, and yeah. I probably won't be able to finish it, but I just kept going and going and going. And then I shared it with somebody and they said, oh, this is good. And I like this. And, and just there's, you know, finding that confidence where it's like, oh yeah, maybe, can that's a scary but giving it to someone that reads always yeah yeah because you've got a person it was lisa you know and lisa is <laughs> the most successful tv writer to you know in the country at the minute so um but she was very very kind and then i was able to send it to a couple of production companies and a couple of them actually were interested in so i was like oh well, maybe I'm on yeah <laughs> Yeah, and so. did you did you sit down and research? Okay, you know, uh, in terms of formats for writing pilots for shows, or did you just blodge it out and then go back afterward and go, okay, here, here, here's how they want to see a script? Or I just did it out of my head, um, but yeah. I did it like I think I wrote it like a director, so I found stage directions really easy, um, yeah. and I found dialogue really really difficult. Um, a new final draft, you know, like there's yeah. something like that, which I don't know, a blank page would feel really, really daunting to me, but in a way like final draft, like tells you what to do next, you know, uh, do. do stage directions. So you do stage directions and then you have to write dialogue. So, oh, I'll write dialogue. But, um, but I definitely came to it with a very like visual, I would sort of see the pictures that, uh, because yeah. I'm a director and then sort of fill in the. Fill in the blanks. The, and I suppose, that, yeah. I suppose as well, TV or, TV and film is is more visual language. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Whereas stage has to be, you know, dialogue driven. So um, yeah, absolutely that directing head and then kind of seeing where it goes is going to read well better. Yeah. Can you tell us the name of it or just don't do it? No, I can't. I can't okay. it. But it's, yeah. It's, so when, it's when, when do you find out? What, what stage? When do they go, right, okay, we're going to give us a pump or can you not talk about it? So, uh, uh, production company wants to make it and I'm so they've read the draft and I'm, I'm currently working on the I've been given some really brilliant notes so I'm sort of supposed to be working on uh those notes this fortnight but it's like you know <laughs> you've got two weeks locked in a hotel room you think you can be really productive but of course it's, it's the opposite yeah yeah impossible so, so how did you how, how did you know what production companies to go for? Did you look at what work they did? Did you just do the shotgun approach and go right away at all these people? It was a producer of Harry Potter who also works in TV. I was able to to send it to him and I'd been sort of asking him a lot about how to get into, and he was actually the inspiration for, for it because after I had done the short for the lyric, I sent it to him and I said, you know, I'd love to do more of this. And he says, well, as a director for TV, there are sort of two ways into it. You can do you can do the casualty route or you can do like, you know, season eight of Call the Midwife and go into a show that already exists and sort of learn the ropes that way. Or you can create your own show. Um, and actually creating your own show is the much more creative way in. Uh, so yeah. in particular, the director coming from theatre, he thought that that's probably what I would want to do. Yeah. So that's why I took a punt at creating my own show and then sent it in. So how we days. So that's that's two punts. You have a punt at writing somebody a letter, and you had a punt at writing a TV show, and they both paid off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, was there was there any was there a connection in the feeling or the vibe? 
the same when, when you were sitting down going, I'm thinking I'm going to go with TV or I'm thinking I'm going to write this guy a letter? Is there a certain... Uh, is there a certain gut instinct or anything you kind of go, I'm, I'm going to give this a go? Is there something telling you to give it a go? Or Yeah, it's like you wrestle with yourself. It's the real desire it, because you want the thing, but it's obviously it's terrifying and agonizing. And just being from Ireland and working class and you, know, you just overthink everything and think, oh, I don't deserve to, you know, contact these people or to ask for this opportunity. But, you know, so you in a way have to really force yourself to yeah to you know and i i work with people in this industry and from different backgrounds and you can tell that they have never had that torture yeah asking for something or asking for what they want you know and because of their upbringing or because of where they've been educated you know there's there's just a kind of i, I deserve this and i'm going to ask for this which I don't know, I, I think us as yeah. people from the North of Ireland don't necessarily have that. <laughs> so then what's, so you, you, you'll you do um, Harry and Oz, you come back, are you straight in to your TV show? Do you have another theatre show? Yeah, so I mean, theatre, who knows at the minute, we're just waiting for the theatres to reopen and before anybody can plan. Uh, my partner's an artistic director of a theatre, so and just it's been weird the last year because I've been not busy at all, and he's been just flat out and yeah. uh, and like planning three different versions of everything because you never know if if what you plan is actually going to happen or you're yeah. going to have to move online or or do something else. And it's I mean, artists have had it so hard in the last year, and and uh, but also. And I know people are like, oh, well, those people have full-time jobs who are, who are running venues and stuff, but actually just witnessing it up close, just the the work and the just how hard it has been for people that are having to try and save yeah. theatre. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot, you know. Yeah. I would say but, it would be a, a nightmare to be in a venue at the moment. It's, it's one of the yeah. first times I've, I've said it myself. I'm delighted I'm not in the full-time venue yeah. job because yeah. it's going to change party. It's not even yeah. weekly. It's gonna be like, what's happening now? You know, it's a crazy one. So, what what advice would you have for uh, anyone who's directing or writing or, you know, l- looking to advance their career? I think don't just again going back to the take a punt thing. Don't be afraid to ask for help and don't have that. Um, I I'm not deserving to ask for this. Um, most people are ultimately nice and most people will give you a chance and if if they can't help you they'll be able to point you in the right direction and um just so I would always say like young people like in where we're from just reach out to people and they won't think badly of you for it because everybody started somewhere and everybody will want to help you get a leg up like I wrote to um last year there's a I did drama at Queen's and I'm a member of like a Facebook group for alumni and I just wrote a message on it last year saying, because I really felt for the final year students who weren't at university. Yeah. And I said, if there's anybody that wants advice or if there's anybody that wants, you know, to have a chat about the industry, about ways into the industry, give me a shout. And, I, and a couple of people re- reached out to me, as the Americans say, and, you know, I've been helping them to just figure out because I just don't know how young people do it these days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a different ball game, I suppose, like... Uh... Many moons ago, when we started, there was no TV or film industry in Belfast. You, if you yeah. wanted to work in theatre, you, you worked in theatre. Trying to get your head around that now, although there's more opportunity, must be insane. I don't know. Like I, so I don't live in Belfast, so I can't properly yeah. talk about it. But it feels like there is more, probably more work being made. But pathways in for young people, you know, like Biffy, that that course of Biffy has yeah. gone and um, the course of Queens that feels like it's become largely theoretical and like you yeah. think about when we were coming up and you know yeah. the stuff like Rainbow Factory or like Rachel Tucker and Jeremy McCarthy at Arts Youth or yeah. what Pointer was doing and there was just so much and so many ways in for young people yeah. and I don't know if that's still the case but I'm certainly just not aware of that kind of yeah so where, where, where are you based if, where, where is home London is home for me, yeah, North yeah. London. And do you think that uh, 
is this, is there still the thing if you want to kind of and not say succeed but maybe push yourself uh you, you kind of got to do a stint in London at some point yeah it's interesting isn't it um ideally not it would be you know i'd rather it wasn't the case yeah i or even anywhere but where you're from do you, do you think it helps to uh get out of belfast or northern ireland for a bit to work on something else to see, I mean, it's, to see differently it's certainly helpful to broaden your mind and <coughs> broaden your horizons and um you, you just learn so much from meeting different types of people and, and doing different types of work. But I do still think it's a shame that people have to leave um, in order to, in some cases, be respected by yeah. the people who make decisions at home. You have to have gone away and earned stripes elsewhere. But yeah. also just, I mean, it would be great if everybody could just stay where they're from and, and make work where they're from. And if there was enough work and, and like, I'm working with actors in London all the time and they're and or AV checking them and they're all filming in Belfast. And I just think, why why are all these English actors over working in Belfast? And most of the artists I know from Belfast have had to move to London or Dublin or um or or stay in Belfast but don't get like regular full-time work. Yeah. It's tricky. So uh the the TV is the the direction you're gonna go. Uh, well, what, what happens if you get a mad hit on TV? On TV, yeah. Oh yeah, we, we, we constantly th we constantly think, oh, this is going to die on source. <coughs> I, I I don't know anybody who actually thinks, oh, this is this is going to super succeed and be great. So I, I always wonder when someone gets a hit like Derek or whatever, your head is going to be gone. Well, I've, I've succeeded now. The pressure is now mm. tenfold. What are you going to do yeah. if you get a mad hit? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just keep, keep turning them on. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, I, I I can't even think that far ahead. I'm just okay. it, it's all so new, and it like I have got the hit because I I yeah, did yeah. a thing I I didn't know I could do, and I did it, and people are responding positively to it, and so already like I'm just walking in air, air about that, and everything on top of that is bonus. bonus upon bonus upon bonus, you know, so. I, I just how, really... how do you measure success in terms of set? We'll, we'll go back to theater because obviously that's your main background. How do you uh, gauge your own personal success on a project, whether it be during the project or, or after the project? I um, I always say when I'm talking, when I'm wondering about whether or not to do a job. Um, it has to be either good for your bank balance or good for your career or good for your soul. Yeah. And it has to be two of those things. And if it's not two of those things, you never do the job. And sometimes you'll do a job for money or because it's high profile, but it's not the work you want to be doing. Yeah. Um, the best work is all three. The best work is yeah. you know, when you feel that you've made your best work as an artist and it's received well and you know it pays well. Like That's just really, really glorious when something like that happens. And yeah. That's, okay. that's how I would measure success, I suppose. Well, listen, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, grand.